Hello and welcome back to another video. So here we are on our second topic of advanced modeling that is clustering. Now in this video we will learn what is clustering then how clustering is done. So basically there are two methods that we will be looking at. First is k-means clustering and then hierarchical clustering. After that we will do one assignment on each of these topics. So now let's start with our first topic what is clustering. So cluster analysis is an unsupervised machine learning technique. Now recall in an unsupervised machine learning technique, we don't have data to train the model and we use our input data directly for our modeling. Now cluster analysis is used to cluster the data into groups such that within a group the data points are homogeneous and between the group the data points are heterogeneous. Now what does this mean? Let's say we have apples and oranges. So cluster analysis will make clusters such that we have one cluster of apples and one cluster of oranges. Now to do this, we cluster the data around the centroid of the cluster. We'll see this how we can do it in the upcoming slides in detail. Now the next question is where cluster analysis can be used. So there are various applications of clustering. Let's say we have a group of people and we want to sell our products to them. So here we can use clustering to personalize and target based marketing. What clustering will do here? It will group the people of similar trades and likelihood to purchase. So in this way we can use clustering for target based marketing. We can also use clustering in email spam filtering. What it does is it looks at different sections of email header, sender, content etc and then group the emails to further classify them as spam or no spam. And apart from this there are many more applications of clustering. Now let's move on to the next topic. Now there are two methods of clustering. First is k-means algorithm. It is the most common approach. And then second is hierarchical clustering. So let's start with k-means algorithm. Here the first step is to randomly initialize k clusters having centroid as mu1, mu2 up to mu k. As you can see here we have randomly initiated the centroids marked here with cross. Now assign a cluster to each training example xi that is the row of the feature vector for each observation. Here you can see we have used i as superscript in x. This simply means i as feature. Now how do we assign the observations to the clusters? So we measure the distance of each point from the centroid. Let's say we have two centroids as shown in the figure with orange and green cross. And we have two points shown with orange and green dots. Then we will measure the distance of these two points from centroid 1, say orange cross. After that, we will measure the distance from the second centroid, that is the green cross. Now this is called Euclidean distance and it is given by the formula shown here. So based on the minimum distance of a point from the centroid, we will assign that point to that particular cluster. As you know, there are different distance measures but here we are using Euclidean distance. Now in the next step, we will move all the centroids mu1, mu2 up to mu k to the average mean of all the training data points assigned to that cluster centroid and then repeat step A and B until no further updates in the centroid is observed. That is how we assign the clusters. Now let's understand this with the help of an example. So in the first step we initiated two centroids. Then we measured the distance of each observation and assigned clusters based on the minimum Euclidean distance. Now as you can see in the first figure we have all the points in blue color. But in figure 2 we have few points in orange color and few in green color. This shows that they have been assigned into orange cluster or green cluster. After that we will shift the centroid such that it will be the mean of all the training observations present in the respective cluster. Which means orange cluster will have centroid that will be the mean of its observation in orange cluster 
and similarly green cluster will have a centroid which is the mean of the observation in green cluster. Now we will again measure the Euclidean distance and shift the centroids. We will continue this step until no further updates in the centroid is observed. So you can see in figure 5 and figure 6 there is no update in centroid of the cluster. Hence these will be the final clusters. Anyways you don't have to remember all these things. All these things will be done by R. I am just explaining you to make you understand the concept. Now let's move on to the next topic. As usual for guiding the algorithm we use a cost function. The function given below is called as distortion function and the algorithm converges when the below function is minimal. This is also called within cluster variation or sum of squared distance. It is nothing but the square of the distance from each point to its centroid within a particular cluster as we saw earlier in the figures. Now total within cluster variation is given by the below formula and this is called as goodness of fit. Means we will have to minimize it to get the best model. Now to get the best model, we not only have to minimize the within cluster variation of one cluster but for all the clusters. Then only we will get the best model. Hence we use total within cluster variation. Now moving to the next part. So the next question is how many clusters we should have? Well there is no direct answer for this. We can select the number of clusters based on some pre-belief based on our experience of the trade etc. However, there are two common approaches that we use for this purpose. The first approach is the elbow method. Here we plot distortion, which is our cost function, against a number of clusters. And wherever it forms the elbow, as shown here on the screen, we can use it as the cut point and consider number of clusters corresponding to it. That is how elbow method works. Then the other method is the downstream metric method. In this method, we associate some performance metrics such as sales, revenue, efficacy, etc. with the chosen number of clusters. And then our aim is to get the optimized metric. For example, a t-shirt manufacturer wants to decide that how many different size types he should produce. So what he can do for the first instance, he can produce three shirt types, small, medium, large. So we will have three clusters. But then we have to think from the customer's point of view and see if the revenues will be more if they have say 5 t-shirt sizes to choose from instead of 3. So basically the downstream metric will be your yardstick in deciding the number of clusters. It could come from your past experience, your knowledge of trade etc. So that is how you select the number of clusters. Our next method is hierarchical clustering. In this approach, we create a hierarchy of clusters, which can be represented in a tree-like diagram called a dendrogram. There are two common approaches for it. First is agglomerative clustering, which is most commonly used, and then divisive hierarchical clustering. Let's see each one of these. In agglomerative clustering, we assign each individual to an individual cluster. Suppose we have four data points, then we will assign one cluster to each data point. And as a result, we will have four clusters as shown here. Then at each iteration, what we will do is, we will merge the closest pair of clusters and repeat this step until only a single cluster is left. So that is how this approach works. Now in divisive clustering, we go the other way. We start with a single cluster and assign all the points to that cluster. So we will have only one cluster in the beginning. Then at each iteration, we split the farthest point in the cluster and then we repeat this process until each cluster only contains a single point as shown here. So that is how divisive clustering works. Now here we have a sample dendrogram. Let's understand this. The distance between cluster is shown by the vertical line. For example, distance between cluster 1 and cluster 2 is shown by a vertical line and it is equal to 3 and so on. We use a threshold to decide the number of clusters. Generally, we try to set the threshold in such a way that it cuts the tallest vertical line. If you see in the above figure, we set the threshold as 12 and made a cut to get two clusters. 
One more thing we can know from here is the clads as shown above. Clads are arranged according to how similar or dissimilar they are. Clads with similar height are more similar. That is cluster 1 and 2 are more similar compared with cluster 4 and cluster 3 and 5 are more similar compared to other clusters. Now hierarchical clustering procedure requires two important metrics. First is the distance measure and second is a linkage criterion. A commonly used distance measure is Euclidean distance that we saw in k-means clustering. There are many other distance metrics that have been developed and can be used as well. The choice of distance metric should be made based on the theoretical concerns from the domain of study. For example, if clustering crime sites in a city, city block distance may be appropriate or the time taken to travel between each location, etc. However, if there is no theoretical justification for any alternative, the Euclidean distance should generally be preferred. Second metric is the linkage criterion. After selecting a distance metric, it is necessary to determine from where distance is computed between two clusters. So we have three types of linkage criterion, single linkage, complete linkage and mean linkage. Single linkage is the shortest distance between two points in each cluster. Then complete linkage is the largest distance between two points in each cluster. And mean linkage is the average distance between two points in each cluster. Now again, the choice of linkage criteria should be made based on the theoretical consideration from domain of application. Where there are no clear theoretical justification for choice of linkage criteria, Ward's method is the sensible default. This method is called minimum increase of sum of squares. It aims to minimize the sum of squares distance when we merge two clusters together. So if there are many clusters, so Ward's method will merge those clusters for which the sum of squares is minimal. You can explore this further if you want, but for now, I think this is enough for us to know. So alright guys, we are through with another powerful technique that is clustering. We have discussed what clustering is, how clustering is done. We have seen two methods for it, k-means clustering, where we discussed the algorithm, the cost function and how to decide the number of clusters. Second method was hierarchical clustering. There we saw two techniques agglomerative and divisive clustering. We also learned about the distance measure and linkage criterion. Now let's see how we can do these in R. So I'll catch up in the next video where we'll solve our first assignment on clustering.